this lesson, we're going to talk about the coronavirus infection or COVID-19. So we're also going to cover everything from the virology and the epidemiology, any testing, the treatment, and the nursing implications. Uh, so what you're going to be responsible for and also patient education. So what is the coronavirus? Well, the first thing we have to look at is the virology and the epidemiology of what's going on with it. So when we talk about virology, we're actually talking about the study of the actual virus itself. Now, this virus is known as SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual name of the virus. Now, when we talk about uh, and kind of in common nomenclature with the, the media and what we're hearing in reports from the World Health Organization and the CDC, they're often using this term COVID-19. And what COVID-19 is, it's the actual illness that's been designated by the World Health Organization. So that's the difference. Now, when we talk about epidemiology, we also want to look at the study and the progression of the illness. So back when this all started in the, in the first uh, kind of version that we put of this lesson out, there had been about 150 cases in the United States and uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about 50 deaths. That was somewhere around the beginning of March. So today is actually April 9th. Uh, 2020. And what we've figured out is from that time, from that very beginning of, of March, um, all the way to this point, that in the world, there have been 89,733 deaths and 1.5 million infected um, with the confirmed test. Now, in the United States, when we talk about that number, remember, we were at about 150 and about, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of 50 deaths at the beginning of March. Now, as of this date, there's been 431,000 confirmed coronavirus or COVID-19 cases and 14,700 deaths in the United States. And what that means is that this is very, very aggressive. Now, when we're looking at the progression of the illness, we also need to consider how contagious it is. Now, the interesting thing about the, the flu versus coronavirus is that even though the flu... Uh, it, it makes a lot of people sick and it and it unfortunately has a, a you know it kills a lot of people but the difference between the coronavirus and the flu is that the coronavirus is a novel virus we have no built-up immunity we have no vaccine currently and what's happening is there's no herd immunity there's no ability for us to find it there's a lot of things that are in question in terms of trials and what we found is that uh when this illness progresses it actually uh it triggers a lot of inflammatory reactions and that puts people uh, susceptible to sepsis and multiple organ failure and respiratory failure, and it's requiring high levels of ICU care, and it's become extremely, extremely challenging for the healthcare community. Now, when we talk about transmission and safety, we want to think about it from the nursing perspective. When you're taking care of a, a COVID-19 patient, what you need to remember is that and there's a lot of evidence that's now showing that this is an airborne illness. So we need to be, um, you know, putting on N95 masks. We need to be make sure we need to make sure that we have all the necessary proper protective equipment. Um, and this has been a bit of a challenge in the United States in that there has been such um, an accumulation by the consumer to go out and grab all of the 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 masks and gloves and gowns and goggles and all that stuff from consumer stores. And what's happened is it's created a major shortage for actual healthcare workers so much so that they're actually having to reuse um, personal protective equipment. And that's become a, an extreme challenge and ex it's become extremely frustrating for healthcare workers. But the best case scenario is that you have your gown, you have the necessary eye protectant, uh, the face shields are extremely important. Um, but in terms of what uh, every healthcare facility is doing, make sure you're following those protocols. But at a minimum, you, mean a, you need an N95 mask, which is going to be extremely helpful. Now, when we also look at at-risk po patient populations, the, initially the concern was that it was affecting um, disproportionately higher amounts of geriatric patients. What we've actually found is that it's still affecting uh, even younger patients. Now, there are a couple of factors that play in and make uh, the geriatric patient population or uh, patients that have certain comorbidities, that actually makes them more susceptible to getting sick and um, having long-term or more detrimental effects from the virus versus younger patients who have higher uh, immunities. Um, but just because you're younger and you've got a really healthy immune system does not mean that you are not susceptible to this illness. So we all need to be practicing the social distancing 
in our own personal lives. And then we also need to make sure that we are uh, protecting ourselves at work. So let's talk about assessment. The incubation period for the COVID-19 is about 14 days. It can be up to 14 days. Some of the literature is saying anywhere starting around two days, but it can actually be uh, somewhere in, around five. So if you have a patient that exhibits these common types of symptoms, you can see a lot of the symptoms here, but the number, the top three that you're gonna see, the first one is gonna be fatigue. They're gonna be tired. The next one you're gonna see is this shortness of breath. This is another big issue uh, because it's a primary, uh, a primary respiratory illness, that's where you're going to see it. And the last one that you're going to see is fever. These are going to be your number three. You're also going to see some of these other ones. So if you have a patient that's been exposed to uh, maybe a, a an area where COVID-19 was found, whether it was in China, overseas, um, or in a highly uh, or highly populated areas where there have been known um, confirmed cases of COVID-19, that's where you're actually going to see a lot of uh, these symptoms start to build up. And then this is where it becomes a major problem. So now let's go to therapeutic management. The biggest thing about therapeutic management is prevention. You can go through your patient education. We'll talk about patient education in a minute, but the biggest thing you have for your patients, especially um, in like a clinic setting where they're like, I'm concerned I'm gonna get uh, this coronavirus, this COVID, what, do I, what can I do? The biggest thing they can do is wash their hands and make sure that they stay away from populated areas. Now, the next thing that we can do is something uh, testing. If there's a concern that a patient has uh, the, the coronavirus, you can actually use these tests. There's something called a PCR test, and we'll get into kind of how we discontinue those. Um, but the thing about this is it takes a couple of days, and this is where it becomes important, especially for those hospitalized cases that you need, that you know that you're going to have to hold on to them for a little bit, and you're going to make sure that we get through that. So what are we going to do for our patient? Well, the thing we're going to do is provide supportive treatment. We're going to maintain their hydration levels. We're going to maintain maintain their nutrition status. We're also going to uh, maybe uh, try to help them stave off those fevers. Uh, so we can use like acetaminophen or uh, ibuprofen to help with those, try to make them comfortable. But the big thing is to make sure they're eating and drinking. Uh, all their uh, systems are functioning and provide the supportive uh, therapy. If they end up needing uh, IV fluids or that kind of support, that's another uh, avenue that you can experiment with or that you can explore. In terms of experimental studies, there are a couple on the market because there is no vaccine out there. The problem is, is that we have to start to try some other things in the meantime to try to help reduce uh, the this prevalence of this illness. So what they're trying now are these antiretrovirals. And what these antiretrovirals do is they are used in things like the flu, um, other viruses uh, like HIV, they're trying to see how well these work for these cases. In some cases they're working, again, it is highly experimental. Just know that if you start, if you have a patient that is testing positive for coronavirus and you are using these antiretrovirals, that that's what they're being used for. Now, the big part about the discontinuation of, the, uh, the, of your infection precautions, your droplet precautions, is that you're going to, uh, you're often gonna pay attention to this testing. What the CDC is currently recommending is uh, two negative uh, two negative PCR tests, and there has to be a complete resolution of all of their symptoms in order for them to have the the, discon uh, the discontinuation of the infection precautions. That doesn't mean that they can be discharged. It's the, it just says that, hey, we don't think that they're a concern. But the biggest thing here is you need to follow your facility policy because that facility policy is gonna pay attention to what the CDC says and also what the World Health Organization is saying. So just make sure that you're following those policies specifically, but these are kind of general guidelines. So patient education is where you can be of real value to your patients. The big thing here is prevention. You want to prevent the uh, the transmission by washing hands. Washing, having your patient wash their hands, you washing your hands, having everybody that you know wash their hands is going to help prevent the transmission of this illness. The thing about it too is that because again, if we look at things like uh, the droplet precautions, because the that means that it's a cough uh, and those droplets are going to land on the surface. And what happens too, and we'll get to this in a minute with when we're dispelling myths, is that anytime that cough is there, we want to make sure that we are uh, washing our hands thoroughly. The other thing you want to do is avoid highly populated areas. And by doing that, you actually reduce that risk. If a patient is homesick, uh, they don't feel well, that that's another time that they should uh, you know, exercise caution there. Now, the other thing about that, I'm going to come back to that, is that if you have a patient that has those onset of symptoms, remember, we have the fatigue, we have we have fatigue, we have the shortness of breath, and we have the fever. 
And let's take into account if a patient has been exposed to an area that has COVID-19. Hey, give them a mask, which we'll talk about thoroughly in a second. Give them a mask, send them to the doctor. If you're in a, if, 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 it's, if it's a friend or some, um, somebody that you know, and if it's a patient, get them a mask, get them to the hospital, get them tested or have them seen by a provider. That's going to be the best thing that you can do. The mask is really important, but here is why. We're going to go to dispelling myths. The thing about the mask, when should a patient wear a mask? I'm sure that your patients are going to ask you this. When should a patient wear a mask? Uh, the only time a patient should wear a mask with this, uh, this illness is when they, are, they think that they are sick with it. The masks are not going to help people prevent themselves from getting the illness. Here's what's going to happen with that. Number one, they're actually going to buy up all of the masks. And by doing so, it actually decreases the amount of masks available for healthcare workers. This is a problem. So by having a bunch of people go out and buy these masks to hoard for themselves, and it actually creates a problem within the system. So by just explain to your patients, hey, don't go buy a mask. You're not actually doing yourself any good. It doesn't prevent uh, you from getting the coronavirus. Number two, the reason you sh that you should uh, try to incur or discourage uh, patients from going out and buying masks is because they are often, uh, they need to be fit tested, especially the N95 mask. It's really common to go out. You can go to any one of your um your home improvement uh, stores and they have those N95 masks. But like, if you're like me and you have a beard and it's not going to fit and seal, right? It needs to be fit tested. So the N95 masks aren't going to work well. And the other problem is that people will reuse a mask and by reusing the mask, it actually creates a couple of problems. Number one, uh, they're constantly adjusting it because it doesn't fit well. And number two is that they are reusing something that potentially has uh, either bacteria or they have viruses or they've been exposed to the virus and now they're taking their hands and touching their face with it and they're potentially exposing themselves to that uh, to that coronavirus. We don't want to do that. So do uh, you know if you have the opportunity, encourage your patients to wash their hands to avoid populated areas and try to they don't need to go out and buy masks because it's not going to do them any good. The other uh, another type of common question is, is are there any medications on the market to help uh, cure or prevent um, the coronavirus? And the answer is currently no. There are some, like we talked about earlier, there are some experimental studies, but the thing here is that there uh, I, there are some, some future plans to get a, a vaccine developed, but there's nothing concrete right now. There are no medications. There are no preventative measures uh, in terms of medication to keep people from getting it or to treat it. So it's all about supportive therapy. And the last thing about animals, uh, a lot of people will ask, can my, can my dog uh, give me a uh, coronavirus? Can my cat carry coronavirus? Can uh, any of my pets do it? Can my, my lizard do it? No, the answer is no. The, they're not carriers for it. Um, so just be prepared that, you know, hey, can if that's a question you have, hey, no, you're not going to get it from your pet. All right, guys. So let's recap. The first thing about the coronavirus is we need to focus on prevention. The, this is the most effective way to stay healthy. Number two, uh, droplet transmission is the most common type of uh of transmission uh, methods. So we need to make sure that our, uh, we need to avoid people that are sick. We're gonna wash hands. That's gonna be your best option in order for uh, reducing that transmission. The next thing is treatment. If treat, if you are taking care of a patient, supportive therapy is going to be your best option. And then you don't be surprised if you are seeing some experimental studies like those antiretrovirals. Uh, those can are starting to be introduced, but we don't know, we don't have enough data on them yet to determine how effective they are. Then you have protection. Protection is going to be your best bet, especially when you're taking care of patients, exercise, whatever facility policy there is, protect yourself as a nurse. Um, if you think you need to do something a little extra, uh, make sure you're following those facility pol policies and protecting yourself. And then the, the last thing is education. This ties back to prevention. You want to focus on prevention for those patients, make sure they're washing their hands, avoiding uh, those really populated areas, uh, coughing into their elbow, um, if staying at least you know three feet away to six feet away. That's sometimes not enough, but make sure you're staying away from patients who may have respiratory illness. And if you do think um, you do have a patient that uh, thinks that they are sick with the coronavirus, have them seek treatment early. We hope that this lesson has been extremely helpful in understanding what's going on with the coronavirus. We love you guys. Now go out and be your best selves today. And as always, happy nursing.